you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, kinda. I mean, kinda. See, this is what the enemy does. He knows that the best lies have some truth to them, and so he gives you some truth, but he leaves out a lot of, a lot of context. He shows you the bait, but he hides the hook. And so he says, yeah, your eyes will be open. Yeah, your eyes will be open. But he doesn't tell them where that is going to lead. It reminds me of the medications you see advertised on TV where there's some commercial that uh, is introducing a new pharmaceutical product that's going to clearly solve whatever problem you might have. And, and in the commercial, people are so happy about it. Like you feel like, even if I don't have that problem, I need to try that. I need to talk to my doctor. And so... <laughs> In the commercial, you have people running through fields. Music is playing. There's like a golden retriever bouncing along as they talk to you about how this is, this is what you need. And then how's the commercial end? Like just all side effects. Just really quickly, just want to tell you everything this is possibly going to do to you should you take this medication. And, and so I came across this uh, satire article kind of making fun of this trend. Um, and it was a, a, an advertisement for a medication uh, to uh, address joint pain. The direction said take two tablets every six hours for joint pain, and then it gave the side effects. This drug may cause joint pain, may cause <laughs> nausea, headache, or shortness of breath. You may experience muscle aches, rapid heartbeat, impotence, and ringing in the ears. If bowel movements become greater than 12 per hour, consult your doctor. <laughs> You may find yourself becoming lost or vague, may cause, may cause stigmata in Ukrainians. You may feel a powerful sense of impending doom. Do not take this product if you're uneasy with a locked jaw. <laughs> this drug may shorten your intestines by 21 feet. Women experience a lowering of the voice and an increase in ankle hair. Sensations of levitation are illusory, as is the sensation of having a phantom third arm. 20 minutes after taking the pills, you will feel an insatiable craving to take another dose. Avoid this with all your power. <laughs> and, and this is how the enemy works. He says, hey, here's, here's a solution to your problem. If you, if, you just, if you just take a bite of this, your eyes will be opened. Well, yeah, they will. But he doesn't tell you what you're going to see. He doesn't tell you where it leads. He doesn't mention the psychological trauma. I see a lot of women deal with after an abortion. He doesn't mention... Uh, the feeling of being used or the feeling of using somebody. When you sleep with someone you're not committed to, Lee leaves that out. It doesn't talk about how sexual sin can come back and haunt your marriage years later. He doesn't say anything about regret, the regret you feel when you're sitting across the table from your adult children and they're letting you know that you were not there for them when they needed you. He doesn't talk to you about the anxiety of wondering when your boss is gonna catch on, and wondering if your spouse is gonna find out. Doesn't mention any of that. He leaves out all the side effects. Doesn't talk to you about addiction and how it's gonna define your life and dominate your existence for years. Genesis chapter three, verse six, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it and she gave some to her husband who was with her. He's, hey, why don't you say something, buddy? Like you, your wife's talking to a snake. Seems like you might want to speak up. He was with her and he ate it. And this is the moment that sin enters the world. And since then, the world has been under the curse of sin. So very much like a virus, if you think of it that way, sin entered the world through Adam. 
and the virus spread and the infection spread to everyone and to everything. Romans chapter five, verse 12 puts it this way. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone for everyone sinned. I'm infected, you're infected. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans says. We've all sinned. I remember when I first became aware of my infection, my sin infection, my sin nature. I was in the second grade. And in the second grade, your social status is somewhat determined by who's the fastest in the class. And at least for the second grade, I was the fastest boy in the class. Fastest boy. Wasn't the fastest. <laughs> Tressa Roberts was the fastest. But I was the fastest boy, and I'd never go head to head with Tressa in a foot race. I'm not gonna do that. So it's, you know, boys would race, girls would race, and, and yet we would play this game at recess called um, freeze tag, boys chase girls. And I would try to catch Tressa, and she was always a half a step ahead of me. Could never quite, could never quite catch her. And then one day we were playing freeze tag, she was just ahead of me a little bit. I couldn't get her. I could, couldn't reach her. But she was running so fast that her ponytail was just flying back at me, <laughs> just, just mocking me. And I realized I can't get her. I can get her ponytail. And I, without thinking, I just felt that pride and jealousy. And I grabbed her ponytail and I yanked it. And she fell backwards, started crying. I immediately thought, what have I done? And just ran away to hide. And I went to hide in the corner of the gym where there was a group of students that played the clapping games. Did you have students like this? They just clapped to like Cinderella dressed in yellow. Did, did you do that? I'm embarrassed that I could say that whole thing for you, but. I went, to hide among, I went to hide among the clappers. I thought, they're not gonna look for me. They're not gonna look for me in the clapper colony. I'll dwell amongst the clappers as long as I have to. And so I, I was hiding in the clapper section and uh, I just had my head down, heart was pounding. And then I saw Mrs. Cruz, who was my kindergarten first grade teacher, go over to Teresa, who was on the ground, and, and she, knelt down next to her, and I thought, Tressa, please don't tell, don't tell Mrs. Cruz, I'm, I'm one of her favorites, don't tell her what I did. And then she stands up and she starts, Mrs. Cruz starts looking around. <laughs> Put my head back down, bell rang, I ran to the second grade classroom, and I sat at my desk, I thought, what? why would I do that? You ever think that? Why, why did I do that? Why did I think I could get away with it? Why'd you have to cry? There's no crying in freeze tag. It's... And what kind of name is Tressa? <laughs> Start blaming her. Mrs. Cruz comes to the uh, second grade classroom and tells my second grade teacher that she needs to see me in the hallway. Oh, uh, I'd never had to go to the hallway before. I'd seen other kids <laughs> go to the hallway. And when I saw other kids go to the hallway, I'd be like, you know, thank you, God, that I'm not like those kids. <laughs> hallway dwellers. And so I, I went out to the hallway, my feet felt heavy, I'm having trouble breathing, I get out there, Mrs. Cruz bends down, looks me in the eye, do you have something to tell me? No. <laughs> did, you, did you pull Tress's hair? No. And then I started crying, which I don't think is what people do when they're innocent. <laughs> and, and she said, I'd be disappointed if you pulled her hair, but I'd be even more disappointed if I thought you would lie to me. And I, I wanted to tell the truth, but I, I felt like I was in too deep. <laughs> Best thing in my mind was to just keep hiding. I doubled down. <laughs> well, I didn't pull her hair, but I did reach out to tag her, and when I reached out to tag her, she turned her head, and her ponytail got caught in my hand. <laughs> and I don't wanna make it sound like it was all her fault, And I could tell she was skeptical, but she couldn't really say too much. And she said something about, well, God knows the truth. Now I went back to my desk feeling pretty good. I thought, oh, I got out of that. Got away with that. 
But then something happened the next morning. During kindergarten, first grade, I'd get out of carpool. My mom would take me to school. I'd get out of carpool, and Mrs. Cruz would be at the door. I'd give her a hug. She'd hug me. But on that next morning, I got out of carpool, and I saw her standing at this door, and I went around to the other door. And I'd see her in a hallway. I'd walk by quickly, try and take a different route if possible. And at recess, instead of uh, playing tag, I just sat up in the bleachers, just watching other kids play tag. I thought I could get away with it, but the minute I sinned, even though no one else knew about it, it started creating separation. It started to sever relationships in ways that I didn't want it to. But the shame I felt caused me to avoid Mrs. Cruz and stop playing with my buddies. And my guess is that that for some of you, that this is the game you've been playing with God for a while. Just trying to hide, trying to avoid. The sin separates. Next week, Albert Tate's gonna be here and he's, he's gonna talk about one of the consequences of sin. Part of the curse is that sin causes conflict between us, particularly men and women. Conflict and confusion. And from the moment Adam and Eve sinned, they knew something was different. It says in Genesis 3, verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and they made coverings for themselves. They covered themselves with, with fig leaves. It's, big, it's a big leaf in the Middle East, big, big fig leaf. Never tried to do this, don't plan on it, but I gotta think that covering your naked body with leaves is, um, is inadequate. Like I, I, I bet you, you still feel pretty self-conscious. And so they hide even more. Their shame just causes them to, to try and cover up. And shame tells me, I, shame tells me I'm, um, I'm strong enough. I don't need any help. Shame drives me away from people who care about me. Shame makes me blame people instead of deal with my own failures. Shame tells me I need to look perfect without appearing like I've made any effort. And shame is deathly afraid of failures being found out and of people knowing and talking about it. Shame makes me sensitive and take, makes me take rejection personally. Shame tells me I'm not enough and I never will be. And shame tells me I never do enough. Shame tries to convince me that I am my mistakes, that God doesn't love me and he certainly doesn't like me. So they cover up and hide. Verse eight says, then the man and his wife heard the sound of God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden but the Lord God called to the man, where are you? Where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked so I hid. I was afraid and, and so I hid from you and this is, what, this is what shame does. And so we try to cover ourselves up, we try to hide, we try to hide behind good deeds and and accomplishments and college degrees. We, we have these fig leaves that we try to use so that nobody will notice. We're hoping we can get by that we're not exposed. And we try to hide behind religion and appearance. Shame tells me that the best thing to do is to pretend when I don't measure up. But it doesn't work. Fig leaves don't work. If that's how you're trying to deal with your shame, it's not how God wants you to live. He wants to free you from that. There's a beautiful verse here at the end of Genesis chapter three, verse 21. It said, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he, he clothed them. So think about just the grace in this, y'all. Like, because of sin, they are covering themselves in these itchy, uncomfortable fig leaves. It's because they disobeyed God. But what does God do? He gives them, he gives them fur. He covers them in skins. How did he get the skins? 
an animal. An animal had to die. First time anything had died. An animal shed its blood to cover the sin and shame of mankind. Does that remind you of another story? It's pointing us to Jesus, the curse reverser, who's going to come in the New Testament. He's going to sacrifice his life as the Lamb of God is going to shed his blood so that his righteousness can cover our sin and shame. So we can walk out in confidence in the presence of God and one another, not because of what we've done, but because of what he's done for us. The Bible talks about this in Romans chapter five, verse 12. It says, sin entered the world through Adam. Verse 19, for just as through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, Jesus, the many will be made righteous. You're made righteous. Jesus covers us with his righteousness, Romans 8, 1 and 2. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Listen, you don't have to hide anymore. You don't have to hide. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So every time you read the news, and every time you're reminded of the curse, Tell yourself it's not supposed to be this way and then ask what's the problem and just be reminded that the problem is, it's not an educational problem. If it was, God would have sent a teacher. It's not a political problem. If it was, God would have sent a king or politician. It's not a healthcare problem or God would have sent a doctor. The, the problem is a spiritual problem. The infection is a sin infection. And so, so God sent Jesus. God sent a savior and he is... He is the serpent crusher, and he is the curse reverser. And in him, J.R. Tolkien says, everything sad is coming untrue. It won't fully be realized until heaven. But he wants to reverse the curse of sin in your life, in your marriage, in your family, in your heart, in your thoughts. He, he wants to take something that's broken and turn it into something beautiful. He wants to reverse the curse. So as we finish up, just I want to remind you of what God said to Adam and Eve when they're hiding in the Garden of Eden. He, he says, where are you? He says he was walking in the cool of the garden, the cool of the evening in the garden. And that word walking, that word walking is an interesting word because it doesn't mean like it was one walk. The idea is that he, he did this. Like that was the custom, that he would meet Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening, and they'd walk in the garden. And so in the cool of the evening, he, he goes to meet and walk with Adam and Eve. They're not there. So he says, where are you? And I know for some of you, when God says, where are you, you hear that in a certain voice. It's more like a, a police officer who's caught you. Where are you? Come out. Hands up. I, I, don't think that's, uh, I don't think that's the way he says it here. He says, where are you? He's concerned. He misses you. It's not how he wanted you to live your life. It's not how he created you to be. He wants to be with you. He wants to walk with you. Where are you? And some of you are hiding from God because you think he's mad and angry. But God is asking where you're at because he, because he misses you. And this is the difference that Jesus makes, that Jesus clothes us with his righteousness so that we can be reunited with God when we put our trust in him. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the grace that you've given us through your son, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, that you did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. I thank you, Jesus, that you want to, in this church, you want to reverse the curse of sin. In this world, you want to reverse the curse of sin. And God, you want us as a church to be your hands and feet, that we would take on your ministry, that we would, we would be curse reversers as well. I pray, God, that if there's anyone here who is hiding, anyone here who's brought some shame, that they would leave it here. They would come out so that they could be found by you and they could walk with you and experience the kind of 
life that you want them to live. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.